It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. Amanda Oros is the daughter of the mother and daughter duo, which is Sweet Pea Design Company. Their love of all things fabric and sewing has fueled their passion for creating beautiful quilts for their clients. Amanda is also a fellow quilting podcaster, so you'll want to check out the Not Your Granny's Quilt Show. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me on A Quilter's Life. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh Uh-huh. I want to start with how I found you. I was looking for quilting podcasts and yours popped up. Now, it surprised me because it looked like your show has been out for a couple years, but it's just recently that it came across my feed. I don't know how those algorithms work, but I don't either. (laughs) I keep looking and then all of a sudden it's there. But the name of your podcast really grabbed my attention because it's not your granny's quilt show. And Mm -hmm. I'm known as granny. So (laughs) (laughs) it was really fun. So tell me a little bit about not your granny's quilt show. Well, it actually was my husband's idea to start a podcast. He's like, you really should. Like, you've got your quilting business. Like, you should really be doing a podcast. And I was like, whatever. And I didn't really want to do it by myself because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say or talk about. But I roped my friend Miranda in and she helped me get it started. And as we were kind of flipping through possibilities for names, we were like coming up with every quilting and sewing pun under the sun. But it seemed like there was already a show with that name. And we were like, no, we don't want to do that. But mostly we were like, okay, what is our focus? We're two millennials. We're just figuring out how to quilt in this quilty universe. Where do we fit into all of this? And ultimately we landed on Not Your Granny's Quilt Show because in no disrespect to grannies, because we know that quilting is a gorgeous art. We have nothing but respect for it. But we're millennials and we have to do things a little differently than our grannies before us did. And things are just different for our lives. And so we wanted to encapsulate that in the title so that people knew that they would be getting something different. So (laughs) that's great. So let's jump back to share with us, where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Boise, Idaho, which is where I'm still at. So. (laughs) haven't gone far. (laughs) So did you travel and come back to Boise or you just never left the area? Initially, when I started college right out of high school, I went to Helena, Montana to go to Carroll College. And that only lasted about three semesters and I came back home. So it was short lived that I was gone. But even then, I didn't really feel like I left because I was home for every break and summer and I tried, but it didn't work. (laughs) (laughs) Share a special childhood memory. Mm. You know, I was thinking about this because I had a really fun childhood, but I think probably my most special memories from my childhood was like my siblings being born because I'm 10 years older than my youngest brother and I'm 15 years older than my youngest sister. So I got to really be present for their births. And it was just something really special that I think just really shaped who I am. And it changed the trajectory of my perspective on my life. And they're the coolest kids in the whole wide world. And so it was really awesome to be able to get to share my older childhood and their tiny baby years with them. And get to watch them grow up as I was growing up. So did they think of you as a second mom? I think in ways like my sister, especially, I always joke that I'm her second mom and my mom's like, ha ha, very funny. I'm like, no, but seriously, she's like, I know. (laughs) (laughs) But I think with Ben, I was still young enough. I was only 10 that we just played and played and played. And he was always with us and our little buddy and We actually just recently went to his wedding 
this spring. So that was kind of like, oh my God. I was like, all right, Natalie. <laughs> she was like, don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> so it is special kind of having that relationship. But I do always say like, I don't know how to be your sister. I just only know how to be like a mother figure. And that feels weird. So <laughs> Other than your quilting business, did you have other employment? Yeah, so I actually am a teacher by trade. So I have an elementary education degree and I have a master's degree in educational technology with a certificate in games and simulation. So I got my master's degree and then promptly quit teaching to do the quilting business full time. And before that, I just worked in retail and coffee shops to get myself through college. So... I've done it all. (laughs) Is there anything else about your family you wanted to share? I just think ultimately that we're really close. And I mean, I own my business with my mom. And so I see them every day. (laughs) And it's been really great getting to grow up with siblings of all different ages, because I think as I'm getting into like kind of middle adulthood, I'm watching my youngest siblings get into their early adulthood and start their journeys in. And I've been married for 11 years. So, and been with my husband for 15 years. And so having that long relationship and seeing like how that's changed me for the better and bringing my husband and his sons into the family has just really been awesome. And to get to share that love with other people is it's really special. We just make our family bigger all the time and we just welcome everybody in like they're one of us already and everybody's welcome. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. If you would have the opportunity to talk to your great, great, great grandchildren, what would you want them to know about you? I think I would just want them to know that I listened to my heart and I followed my passions and I stayed open to growth and change in my life. And that's what led me on the adventures I've been on and get to go on in the future because I'm open to that and seeing different opportunities take me. And I really want to pass that on to future family generations. And I think that's the best thing you can pass on, right? (laughs) And maybe a little quilting. (laughs) (laughs) Besides quilting, are there other crafts you do or have done in the past? Yes, I have come from a super crafty family. So we've always had paper crafting or other. We used to do like full painting. So we would go to these little classes and get these little wooden shapes. They look like the cookie cutter almost like just the outline of a shape. And then we would paint on the details and make like Christmas decorations or Easter decorations. And my mom still has them like these little things that we painted like as little kids. And they're so funny, but yeah, we've just always been crafty. And then I really took to crochet in early college because in Montana, there's kind of a big like unhoused population and people that just kind of move around and they don't want to be in homes but the weather there obviously is so stinking cold and so there was a group that would knit or crochet hats and scarves for them so that's how I got back into it my grandma had taught me when I was about 10 and I did it for a little bit but then I kind of set it down but then once I was 18 or 19 I picked it back up and I still crochet now and it's kind of a comfort project or activity that I can just sit and mindlessly do and It helps with stress because you just have to zone out and be focused on it. And so, yeah, I love crochet. (laughs) There's so many neat little things you can crochet. So that's fun. Yeah, it's fun. I really like it. How about other hobbies? I like to garden. I'm not super great at it, but I do have a little garden kind of happening in my yard. I try to grow different vegetables and things every year just to see what I can make work. And I recently just planted some more native species of flowers to help with pollinators and to just have a cute flower garden because they're so pretty. They're vibrant colors and hardy. So hopefully they'll last through the crazy weather we have. I lift weights. (laughs) I work out. I have a gym buddy. I met her when I was teaching and 
we've been working out together for like eight years or something like that. A little less consistently now, but we at least see each other, you know, a couple times a week to work out. That's something that I need. I need some physical activity to (laughs) keep my brain okay. Podcasting, I guess, has become my newest, latest hobby, I guess. My husband and I like to be outdoors and so we'll go on walks or hikes and just be outside. He's always training for various things. Right now he's training for a Spartan race and so we're out in the hills and he's carrying his big heavy backpack for training purposes. And then he and his older son are going to go on a kind of like a week-long backpacking adventure in Colorado. So he's been kind of getting ready for that and so we spend a lot of time outside, which is nice. We've got gorgeous foothills with tons of trails here in Boise. So it's really easy to get outside, which is great. It makes it really accessible. But I think that's it. (laughs) Nice. Can you tell me what the highest amount of weight that you've lifted? Oh, my gosh. Well, it just depends on the exercise itself. But at one point I was squatting with. 130 pounds, which was like almost equal body weight, which I felt pretty proud of. And then I was leg pressing about 200 pounds. As far as like arms, upper body goes, nothing over like 50 pounds, but I was able at one point to do two whole pull ups and that felt really cool. But I have a crazy knee that was injured in a car accident, it was about 20. And so I had to back off of lifting weights a lot and just go with a lot of body weight things or just like really decrease my weights. And so I'm working my way back up and it's getting stronger and better, but I don't think I'll ever be able to get quite back to where I was before. So I was pretty strong for a minute. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, you don't want that injury to come back. No, it was so painful. So I just need to keep that in mind. and. That's my focus of just strengthening that so that, you know, longevity is the key, right? Do you think any of your hobbies or other crafts show up in your quilting? I think so. As far as like crochet goes, the reading the patterns for crochet is crazy. So if, if you've never done it, it's like reading a whole different language because every stitch is abbreviated. So you're like, do... F L O twice, then B L O, and you're like, what the heck? It's like front loop only, back loop only, double crochet. It's like DC chain three. You're like, what? So it's like reading a whole separate language. So translating that like ability to dissect and kind of understand a pattern really helps in quilting because I'm not afraid to dive in and just figure out what a pattern means. And thankfully, most quilt pattern writers write in plain English. (laughs) So that helps. And I think just that creative eye of looking for color combinations and just design and pattern. Because I might see something in crochet, like a cute crochet blanket or a pillow and think, oh, I want to make that into a quilt. And so I can sketch it out and plan it out as a quilting design and or sewing design and and figure it out that way. So yeah, I, I think it does for me, show up in that way. It's fun to see how that comes about. Share with us who introduced you to quilting. Well, my mom has been sewing most of her life. And so sewing and that concept has been around. But I didn't really get into quilting or know what quilting was until two of my quilty friends, Jen and Beth, they were starting to make quilts. And I was like, that's cool. Like, whatever, I don't do that. And they were making some really cute stuff. And they gave me a quilt for my birthday one year. And I was just taken aback. Like, what? You made that for me? And I still have it. It's so cute. It's like lavenders and grays. And it's just a cute little lap quilt. And they really pulled me in. They were like, you're going to quilt. And that was in my show, the very first episode is Miranda and I talking about Jen and Beth dragging us into quilting, (laughs) kicking and screaming kind of, but now we love it. And it's like all I do. And so yeah, my two besties 
sucked me in. <laughs> <laughs> With all the quilts you've done, or even a quilt that someone else might have made, do you have a favorite quilt? My very first quilt just pops in my head because I use it every day. It's always on my bed. I still love it. I think it's something I would still put together today. It's got all my favorite colors in it. I'm mostly a cool color girl. So I like blues and greens and purples. So I kind of lean towards like peacocks, which the quilt behind me, the fabric is called Peacock Pavilion. So my mom was like, you need this. Anyway, I think that one, just because it was a collaborative effort, it's the one I made when I was learning to quilt, even though it was really hard and I cried a lot about it. I didn't quilt it myself. Jen actually did the long arming on it for me because I didn't know how at the time. And Beth did the binding for me. But I just think that like collaborative, like my best friends rallied around me to help me have this, this thing, this awesome, not just the quilt itself, but this love of quilting. It just really holds a special place in my heart. So I think that one will always and forever be my favorite. (laughs) How cool. Friends are so helpful. They really, really are. So what's a tool that you've come across that you are so happy you have? I really don't like cutting fabric. It stresses me out. (laughs) But the thing I have that has made it a lot easier is the Quilter Select ruler. We have the six and a half by 24 inch ruler. And because of the no slip material that they have on the backside, it covers the entire backside of the ruler. It's really easy to keep everything lined up nicely and it doesn't slide around. So you're not having to fiddle with it as you're cutting. You can just put as even pressure on it as possible and it's not going to go anywhere. It just makes it so much nicer. So that's probably my favorite. So the Quilter Select has that completely on the back and not just strips of it here and there. Yeah, it's not like dots or strips. It's the whole backside is covered. When I started quilting, I was just surprised at all the different steps we take to make a quilt. Do you have a favorite step along the way or do you like each step as we get to it? I love long arming which is why I started a long arming business. (laughs) I think partly I have a little anxiety and I think maybe a little bit of ADHD. And so I think sometimes the piecing, I get anxious because I just want to get to the finished product. But I do like the process of seeing a quilt come together as I start to make the blocks and start to see it come together. I do appreciate that part. And then, yeah, the long arming, I think, is my most favorite part. So... I do get antsy to get to that. Well, you have to love it if you've invested in a long arm and your work is great. So thank you so much. Uh huh. What was your worst quilting experience? That's hard. Because I've had some times where I just want to throw things in the garbage and light it on fire, but. I think it was with a client quilt and something was off with the machine or long arming and something was off with the machine. I think it was the timing and the needle snapped while it was sewing and it kept going and it punched a hole through this person's quilt. And we were freaking out. Like it was the worst feeling. If it's my quilt, I'm like, whatever, I'll fix it. But someone else's Thankfully, she is a very, very gracious human and she loves us. So she was very okay, not okay with it, but you know, she wasn't upset. She was just like, oh, just applique something over it. It's fine. She's like, I just had the fabric and wanted to make something cute. But yeah, that was probably that sinking feeling of just like, oh no, we ruined someone's masterpiece. And thankfully, we got the issues fixed on that and we're very, we're very high maintenance about the maintenance of our machine and we were before, but that situation, it was just like a cluster of craziness. And anyway, it's the only time it's ever happened. Hopefully it's the only time it happens ever, but ugh, I just, that gut feeling, I was like, my mom and I were almost in tears, like, Oh my God, what do we do? (laughs) So probably that. (laughs) Oh, that gut wrenching feeling. You don't know if you're going to throw up or cry or what. 
Exactly. It was not good. There is so much we could do with our time. We have all these different interests, but what pulls you back to quilting? Why are you quilting rather than doing anything else? I guess if I was going to compare like quilting to crochet, since I do still crochet, I think quilting, even though it can take a while to put a quilt top together, it's still faster than crochet. <laughs> like I can make a quilt, a complete quilt faster than I could crochet an afghan or a blanket the same size. So I like that part, the ability I have to put something together. And even if it's just simple patchwork of squares sewn together, it can still be really pretty and and be complete before I could crochet a full blanket. But I just think there's so many cool techniques and there's so many interesting patterns out there and fabric, fabric, I think really is what keeps bringing me back to it. Because like I said, my mom's been sewing most of her life. And so it's always been in my experience that sewing is a thing. And we would always be at Joann's or we had a store called Max when I was growing up here. And it was a crafty store, kind of like Michael's or like Hobby Lobby is. But anyway, I think they had some fabrics too. And I would always get my mom to make like dress up clothes for me or doll clothes or whatever. So I've always been kind of looking at fabric and it doesn't help that my mom and I are both obsessed with fabric because we have a big, 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 big stash. But it also is kind of fun because I have someone to share that with and not just my besties, but I have it in my family too. So it's not just me by myself. Yeah. And just seeing what we can create and it's kind of the ultimate gift. And so I love being able to create something special for special occasions. And yeah. I'm surprised that you could put a quilt together faster than crochet. I was thinking it was the other way around. No way. Because I think with quilting, even though you're cutting fabric into smaller bits, I can sew a seam six inches long faster than I can create the stitches I would need to get a six inch length of a crochet chain. So I just think ultimately the speed with which you're putting things back together is so much faster than crochet because with crochet you're going loop by loop by loop and if you have more than just the basic single crochet stitch you're looping the yarn several times over the hook for just one stitch whereas when you're sewing you're just going you're stitching those stitches really quickly and the amount of time it would take me to do one alternate stitch to a single crochet I can have a whole seam sewn so <laughs> that makes sense who do you usually make your quilts for? Well, right now for lots of other people, because the nature of our business, you know, we're always making quilts for other people. But if I am making one, like on my own time, it's usually for a loved one or for myself, honestly, or our household, I guess, not just for me, but, <laughs> but currently my work in progress is for our youngest. He just graduated high school. So he will get a quilt as soon as I can get time to finish it because he's a tall boy. So I went big and it's going to be really big. So it's taking me a little longer. But anyway, so yeah, just for other people, for babies or, you know, my friends who are having babies and people getting married and yeah. Amanda, describe your sewing space. My sewing space. Well, I'll describe the one for the business because I don't really have one here at home. <laughs> if I do have one here at home, I have to take over the whole living room area. So I don't do that because that's not friendly for anybody. So at my parents' house, which is where we work from, they have a room in there upstairs that used to be two bedrooms, but the previous owners had taken the wall down between the two rooms. And when they were looking for a new house, we were kind of ultimately looking for a better space to have Millie, our long arm, because of their previous house, it was in the basement. So anyway, it's a long room. It's really wide. And then it has some windows. So there was light instead of being crammed in the basement and two closets. And it was just perfect. We were like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the house because this room is insane. And it had all the other things they were looking for, which was nice. But anyway, when you walk into the door, 
it's kind of in the center and Millie is the first thing you see because she's real big and takes up most of the room. <laughs> but to the right, we have our cutting table set up kind of towards the corner by the closet. And then in the opposite corner of that, towards the back of the room, we have our Bernina Artista 730 set up just for embroidery. Um, so we embroider quilt labels for people's quilts if they want that. So that's a service we provide. We've also incorporated embroidery into the quilts. That's what the clients want. On the opposite side of the room, we have a long desk that has our two sewing machines on them. We use Bernina. So we have our Bernina 535 and then we just got the Bernina 770 CAF edition. She's gorgeous with also embroidery capability. So that will be super fun to learn how to use and take the classes for that. And then next to that is our ironing station, which we've built on top of two of those cube shelf units. And so it's two six cubby shelves that we've like screwed together and put casters on the bottom. And then the ironing table that my dad had already built to fit on top of the old ironing board fit right on top of it perfectly. So. We have that. And then in the second closet space, there's no closet doors on it. The previous owners had built kind of a storage chest into the floor space of that. So we installed curtain rods above that. And that's where we store rolls of batting because we also provide batting for clients if they want that as well. And then kind of behind the door on the wall, we have a pegboard system that has all of our long arming thread. So that's kind of fun. It's a supply, but it's so colorful and beautiful. So it kind of adds to the fun brightness of the room. So I think that's it. <laughs> I'm curious, do you call it a sewing room, a sewing studio, or just the room? We usually call it the studio. We do have a room in their house on the main floor that's kind of like our office, but it's also where we store the minky that we sell. And so we differentiate between the studio and the office. And so use those to help ourselves know where things are. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting how we name our rooms. We do it without even realizing it. And sometimes we call it Millie's room. So it's up in the Millie room. <laughs> <laughs> Share a quilting tip. My quilting tip is to keep a sharp blade on your rotary cutter. It will save your arm and hand and it'll save your fabric from being shredded. And I think ultimately that will help you have better accurate cuts, which will lead to better sewing, which will lead to better seams, which will lead to better quilting. So yeah, sharp blades. And do you have a preference on what type of blade to use? No, not necessarily. I'm just Ulfa or I don't know. I just grab whatever is kind of on sale at the time, I guess. And I haven't really had any issues with anything I've tried. So I just use whatever works for you or whatever fits your rotary cutter. Cause sometimes people buy the wrong size and that's the issue, but it's not usually the sharpness or the stability of it. It's just getting the right size and making sure they're sharp. Thanks. Describe how you went from having quilting as a hobby and it ended up becoming a business for you. It's when I learned how to long arm. So like I said, Beth and Jen, my two besties who roped me in the quilting, Jen had been long arming for a while before the rest of us learned how, because her mom also quilts. And so she had been doing the long arming for herself and for her mom at our local quilt shop. And so almost a year into making quilts, she was finally like, just take the class, just do it with your mom or do it with somebody. It's so fun. You'll love it. I know you will. And so we went and signed up, took the class and we learned on an APQS, which is what we ended up buying. And we just loved it so much. We were there so much and trying to rent time and spending so much money on buying punch cards or the passes that ultimately saved money, but we were buying them so frequently. We were like, okay, what the heck? And so we just were kind of joking around and my husband's an ideas guy. He loves to come up with business ideas or to help people get started with a business. And 
he was like, what if you guys bought a long arm and long armed for people, then you could have one and then also make some money. And we were like, I don't know. I don't know. That's a big purchase. And I was pretty gung ho on it. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's make a business. And yeah, my mom was kind of hesitant on it. And my husband was like, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? And she was like, well, we have to pay for a long arm. And he's like, okay, you'll be splitting it 50, 50 with us. So you're not responsible for the full payment. And you and Amanda love to long arm. And I'm sure that her friends would rent it from you guys if they needed time or couldn't get into the quilt shop. And we were like, yeah, that's true. That's true. And my mom was finally like, okay, fine. So we found a quilt show to go to that we knew APQS would be at. So we went to the UQSM show in Utah, kind of near the Park City area. And bought our Millie and got the computer system because we really wanted to do digital pantographs. We didn't want to do everything by hand. And yeah, the rest is history. So here we are. (laughs) It must have been fun to go into business with your mom. It has been enlightening for sure. And we both, I think, have grown a lot in our relationship together, but just as individuals. And I think it's been really fun to have that experience. It's been hard at times, but I think ultimately we're both better for it. And yeah, I love getting to spend time with my mom. I looked up to her my whole life and wanted to be just like her. So I think getting to be around her and share my ideas and listen to her ideas, like she's so stinking smart and she's so creative. And so getting to just be around that energy a lot is, it's energizing and it's really fun. And I feel really fortunate that I get that with my mom. So. Yes, you are. Not everybody has that relationship. That's wonderful. Yeah. What is the name of your quilting business and how did you come up with this name? Our quilting business is called Sweet Pea Design Company. And we came up with the name because my mom learned to sew from her grandmother and they lived on a farm in Nez Perce, Idaho, which is kind of in the middle in kind of the prairie lands. So every summer she'd go to the ranch and sew and cook and learn all these things. But her grandparents called her Sweet Pea. And then by turn, when I was a baby, I was called Sweet Pea by them and by my parents. And it just kind of stuck. And so my mom was like, I just really, I really want this. I was like, well, it's perfect because it's mother daughter. Sometimes in our Instagram posts, because I I run our social media, I'll refer to her as Mama Sweet Pea and I'm Little Sweet Pea and just silly like that. But yeah, so that's where that came from. That is so much fun. I'm laughing because... My husband called our daughter Sweet Pea, but he spelled it Sweat (laughs) Pea. So make sure you're spelling it right if you go to look up this company, please. Yes, please do. (laughs) S-W-E-E-T. So when did you begin this adventure with your mom? How long have you been doing it? We bought our long arm in... 2018. So this will be our fifth year in business because we bought it. And that July in 2018, the machine was shipped to us and we had it all up and running. We had already had the business paperwork done, the LLC paperwork done. And so we were ready to go as soon as it arrived. And so, yeah, so July 2018 was when we first started. Congratulations. That first five years is hard to reach. So that's neat. Yeah, it's had its ups and downs, but ultimately we keep growing every year and it's just getting better. So can you remember when that first person dropped off their quilt for you to long arm on your new machine? Yeah. So our very first client was someone that my friend Jen actually sent to us. She graciously let us put a sign in her yard because she lives on kind of a busy road and it's really close to where my parents live, which is where the machine is. And they knew her, but they had seen the sign in her yard. And so anyway, she ended up sending them to us. And my mom and I both were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, what are we doing? But it worked out and she was a client for a while. And unfortunately she passed away from cancer, but she was really sweet. And my mom got to go spend some time with her before she passed. And so just those relationships are really cool. But yeah, Ginger was really 
amazing. So <laughs> that's neat that you got to have more of a relationship with your first customer. And I'm assuming that you sit down with your customers to figure out exactly what they want done on their quilt. What was that like starting out? At first, it didn't take too much because we didn't have as many designs of pantographs and we didn't have as many threads. And so it didn't take too much time. But now that we've gotten more, more clients with varying needs and, and wants for their quilting, we do sit down and take a lot more time with them. So some people literally just drop their stuff off and they're like, all right, call me when it's done. And they just let us do whatever we want, which is really fun because we get to practice our skills or just try new pantographs or different thread colors. And they're always just happy with whatever we give to them. And we know them well enough to know what they'll like and not like. So that helps. And again, it's that relationship that we've built up over time. But yeah, we really want to make sure we translate their vision onto their quilt. And sometimes they'll defer to us to say, you know, what would you do? And we'll kind of plan that out and discuss that. Yeah, it's ultimately whatever they want us to do. And we'll do our best to make that vision come to life. Communication is so important. And if your business is growing, you must be communicating well. Thanks. Yeah, we do try. And it has been a growing point where we've had to get better and better with our communication. And, and I think a lot of times with the long arming, they're quilters. And so they know the terminology. We don't have to like explain things in such detail with them. But on the other side where we are making custom quilts for people, they don't always know quilting. And so that's where the communication gets sticky sometimes, but we are fine tuning our process all the time so that we are not only communicating what we need from them, but also giving them tools to communicate with us. Managing expectations. Exactly. Is there anything else about your quilting business you wanted to share? Yeah, I would like to share that. It is something that my mom and I are very passionate about. We love quilting. We love quilts. We love making quilts for people. And hopefully that is also communicated through the process of whether we're creating a quilt from scratch for someone or we're just long arming for them or binding or whatever other add-on services they're getting from us that they see the love and care that we put into it and the level of attention we put onto details that matter because we want whatever we send out to be the best thing that we can make so that our clients never have to doubt that they're getting a high quality product and it's worth every penny what they're paying for. So that's wonderful. On one of the episodes of yours that I listened to, I heard that you are a quilt tester. How did that come about and what do you do for that? Yeah, this was honestly like such a cool thing. So I have always And I say always, but I just mean like, since I've been into quilting cottons and finding designers who speak to me and just really picking up my love of quilting fabric, but I found Katarina Rochella's line called Esoterra and it's all dinosaurs and florals and it just spoke to my soul. (laughs) So I purchased the half yard bundle so that I could have all the prints and then I bought the yardage of one of the prints for the backing. And I just held onto it forever. And of course I followed her on Instagram and was just obsessing over her the whole time. And one day she had put a post out that she was looking for pattern testers. She's like quilters of any skill. I'm looking for people to help me test my new patterns that are coming out. And I was like, Oh my gosh, do I do it? I like went to my husband. I was like, um, excuse me. I need to ask you a question. Like, should I do this? And he was like, yeah, what's she going to say? No. And I was like, I don't know. She might like, what if my quilting's not good enough? And he was like, just say you'll do it. And then the rest is up to, you know, the universe, like whatever, just jump in there. So I sent her a DM and I was like, Hey, I am an intermediate quilter. I've been doing it for a few years. I have a business, so I'm in the quilting world and I'd really love to test your patterns. I've always loved your stuff. Da da da. So then I get added to a messaging group in Instagram with her 
and a bunch of other quilters. And thank you so much for being willing to test my patterns. And I was like, oh my God, she's talking to me, like freaking out, getting really sweaty. Uh, anyway, so that first pattern was her Travaya quilt, which she actually adapted from a crochet motif, which I thought was really fitting. And then I was able to finally use my Esoterra fabric because the stipulation for her, because she's an art gallery designer, the fabric has to be from art gallery. It doesn't have to be hers, but it just has to be from art gallery. And I was like, oh, I just happened to have all this fabric. So I was able to test that. And then I tested her very next pattern and her very next pattern. And I did, I think, four. And then I had to stop because our business was getting so busy and I kept pushing everything to the closest deadline. And I didn't feel like I was doing her any service at that point because I wasn't able to actually give as much of my attention to it as I wanted. The only real thing, I guess, is, yeah, being able to give attention to the pattern itself and really be able to read through it with an editing eye and looking for any places where typos are or just measurements might be off or kind of be willing to sacrifice a little bit of fabric to try these things out because sometimes you make some cuts and realize that the number of pieces wasn't quite right or the measurement was maybe a quarter inch off and that makes a huge difference in the long run right so just really having a an eye for detail within the pattern is really all it requires and and even then you've got a group of other testers looking at all these things so you might find something and then go into message about it and someone's already done it and you're like oh great like I also found that too just to kind of back that person up and let them know that you saw what they saw and the benefit of it too is getting the practice of maybe doing skills that you haven't really worked with before which that Travaya quilt was the first really Quilt I had worked with outside of a lot of half square triangles and a lot of just like basic, super easy blocks. It's all strips and squares, that that pattern. So it wasn't difficult. It was just a different way to put a quilt together. So I just really appreciated that because it helped me grow my skills a lot. And it was just fun to be a part of a group of people who were working on the same thing and getting to see their different perspectives on the design and what fabrics they used and where their placement was. And Everybody just ended up with such different, amazing quilts. And it was just so fun to be a part of that process. So how cool. Plus being able to do it for a designer that you love. Yes, absolutely. That was, that was just so fun. And just getting to know her, she's really, truly one of the nicest people I've ever had experience with. And she's just so passionate about design and art. And she's traditionally an artist and has a doctorate in it. And so she truly is passionate about it. And she's on her 25th line of fabric with art gallery. And she just is full of designs. And I'm so excited for her Christmas line that's coming out this year. It's so cute. <laughs> so. And another thing I noticed on your podcast you mentioned, and this has nothing to do with quilting except for being able to decorate, but you have an Airbnb. I do. Yeah. So we rent out a room in our house. My mother-in-law had lived with us for a little while. And so we had given her the master suite in our house and moved ourselves upstairs, which there's two bedrooms and a full bathroom upstairs. So it's fine. And when she was kind of getting ready to move on and to her next place. My husband was like, please, he had been begging me for years to have us do an Airbnb of some style. And I don't know. I don't know. And I finally was like, you know, we're already moved upstairs at this point. All we have to do is finish the flooring in the downstairs. And we took that summer that his mom moved out to finish redoing the downstairs. We took out all the carpet, put in vinyl plank, redid the kitchen, got new appliances. Cause everything in this house was over 20 years old. Like it, it was all the same since it was built. And so it was working, but it was, well, I wouldn't say working. That's like an overstatement, but anyway, so we redid all that, got it looking beautiful and we named it the cozy quilt house, which gave me an excuse to have my quilts on display and gives me an excuse to continue making quilts for our home. So yeah, that's, that's what we've got. <laughs> 
was that easy to do or? Yeah, Airbnb really is great to work with. It was really easy to get started. And you just have to know like your local laws around it. Our city recently enacted a licensure thing that we had to do. And so annually we have to renew it, but we were able to be accepted and have the licensing for it. We're already in a multifamily property. It's a duplex that we own. And so we're already kind of in that zoning for it. But yeah, just as long as you pay attention to those details, it's honestly really easy. And the app is really easy to use and communication is great. And they really are looking for everyone to have a good experience. And so if we have a little issue with a guest, then you can let Airbnb know and they'll let the guest know like, hey, you messed up. And if you don't shape up, you won't be able to use our services anymore. And so it gives people a chance to improve being guests on how their etiquette is if they have issues, but we haven't really had any issues with people. So it's been really honestly so great. (laughs) Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Please share where we can find your business and where we can find your podcast. You can find our business at www.sweetpeadesigncompany.com. We have our website there and you can request a quote through there. In the menu on the website, there's a form you can fill out if you want to mail in any long arming to us. You can always email us with questions. There's that capability through the website as well. We also have an Instagram, which is Sweet Pea Design Company on Instagram. And then my podcast is Not Your Granny's Quilt Show on Instagram. It's at Not Your Granny's Quilt Show. It's on YouTube. Same name. And you can get it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And your links will be on your episode page on my website on A Quilters Life. Well, thank you, Amanda. I so appreciate you sharing your story with us today. And I loved hearing it. Thank you again for having me. I had so much fun chatting with you and sharing a little bit more about me as a person and not just a quilter. So great. Bye-bye. Bye. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening.